Paul Kingsnorth is one of the most interesting voices wrestling with the deepest questions of modernity, religion, and the spiritual void in Western culture. He's a former pagan and a long-time environmentalist, and a couple of years ago he had a completely unexpected conversion to Christianity. I'd started exploring Zen Buddhism. I went on a few retreats and I became a Buddhist and I practiced that for quite a few years and that was very useful in many ways, but it still had a hole in it because, uh, and again, even in Buddhism, the hole is God-shaped. Um, and so I sort of wandered into all sorts of all sorts of areas. I ended up becoming a, a part of a, Wic a Wiccan coven, a coven of neo-pagan witches, which was quite an experience. Um, I was looking for a nature religion, really. Um, that doesn't cut it for all sorts of reasons, partly because it's new and confected. And then I just had a series of experiences, which I wrote about in that essay, which basically dragged me towards Christianity, even though I didn't expect that or want that. This was a really interesting conversation about the deep Christian story that we're all immersed in in the West and whether it's even possible to move outside it. The reason that we have a society that was founded on Christianity is that many thousands upon thousands of people died to build it because they believed in the truth of Christ. That's how it works, right? So if you want to build a Christian society, you better believe in Christ. If you don't, you have to go and believe in something else. Um, so there's no there's no future for a kind of Christianity that's sort of pretending to be Christian because it likes going to church and it likes the forms. I think now that every society has a spiritual core to it, everyone. And if the spiritual core dies, then so does the culture. And I think that's what's happening to us. This was hosted in the Rebel Wisdom Digital Campfire. And if you want to join and take part in live conversations like this, consider becoming a member and hope you enjoy it. Hey Paul, how are you doing? I'm all right, how are you? Yeah, really good, really good. And uh, really glad to have you here. It's been overdue. Um, we first connected, it must be a good five or six years ago now, I think, um, for the, wow. fire, yeah, the Fire and Shadow film that oh, um, yeah. I made with you and um, Andres Roberts. Mm. So that was a kind of project way before this. And I've been, yeah, so impressed with a lot of the, the work that you've been putting out over the last few years. And it's so kind of in the in exactly the right space for the kind of questions that we've been investigating here in Rebel Wisdom. Um, you're, you're talking about kind of the crisis of modernity. You've got to have this fantastic, interesting piece recently about your conversion to Christianity, which I'm sure we're, we're going to touch on in this conversation as well. Um, I guess I'd like to to start maybe by asking, and you've got this whole history with the Dark Mountain Project and sort of the the, the sense of kind of deep environmentalism. I'd, I'd love to hear where your current interests are and how you kind of knit that history together. Um, where where have you ended up? What are you most kind of focused on at the moment? Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? Where have I ended up? apart from in the church, <laughs> which was unexpected. Um, yeah, I don't know whether you ever really end up anywhere. It's a constant process of trying to work out what the hell is going on, I think. I mean, that's pretty much what my my professional life has been, just a process of trying to work out what's going on. Um, I am in a place at the moment where um, I'm looking around me, especially with what's happening with the, 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 the COVID response and seeing a, a, a world, a culture, especially in the West, that is coming apart very fast and becoming authoritarian very fast as well in ways that I wouldn't have expected even a year ago. Um, and I don't know where that's going, but it's frightening. Um, more to the point, I think, I mean, I suppose, you know, I, I started off as a writer about 25 years ago. So I'm, I'm feeling like a feeling like an elder now. Um, I'm trying to, trying to work out how to be a wise one. It might take a while. Um, but I mean, I started off as an environmental activist and then I wrote, started writing about globalization and that led me into a load of questions about human culture and what that was and our relationship with nature and why that was broken. And the more you start to pull on threads, you can see that we're at a lot of cliff edges, um, which is what led me to start the Dark Mountain Project 10 years ago. Um, in the last 10 years, a lot of what we were writing about then has been, I think, just become almost mainstream in terms of the sense that... Um, a lot of things from the, the climate situation to 
the uh, ecological situation more broadly to our kind of cultural and economic fra- fabric is all fraying very dangerously and we're all kind of standing on this trampoline waiting to see if we're going to fall through it, which we are at some point. Um, and so I, I suppose I've, I've been pulling on a lot of threads over the last year or so, um, trying to work out what the kind of, if there is a root cause of this in our, in our cultural fabric, what is it? Um, what's wrong with our way of life? I mean, I suppose that's the question I've always been asking, you know, what is wrong with where we're living that has brought us to this point? How could we get to the point where we could change the climate of a whole planet and kick off a mass extinction event and have a kind of um, global economy of such kind of technological complexity and authoritarianism increasingly? And how could we have built this great machine, as I tend to call it these days, that is very clearly, it seems to me, controlling us rather than the other way around at the moment. What brought us to that point? And it's not as if there's an easy answer or as if I can work it out in any way. But but for my own kind of satisfaction, um, I'm just trying to work that out at the moment because the world at the moment is just incredibly confusing. Uh, a lot of people say that to me. And I think you know, find the world's always been incredibly confusing, but in a way we're bombarded with information from every source at the moment. We've got culture wars and political battles and endless social media feeds and and goodness knows how much information and just kind of bubbles of this, that and the other hitting us. It's almost impossible to work out what the hell's going on anywhere, actually, and and to kind of wade through the swamp of it all. And especially when things are moving as fast as they are at the moment with, with COVID and the responses to it. It's almost impossible to stay sane some days, I find. <laughs> I've had a lot of people say that to me. You know, how do you just keep your head above water? The best way is to turn the internet off permanently, of course, but I haven't done that yet. So um, so I'm still digging, I suppose, but that's it's, just, it's kind of as simple and as clumsy as that in a way. I guess, I mean, you're, you're talking about sense-making. You're, you're, you refer to so many things in that answer. You've talked about the sense-making crisis. You talked about kind of the, the ecological crisis. Um, I'd like maybe, because I, I know that this is a, a, a conversation that, links a lot of those things together is like we've had many people on the channel talk about the whole left by religion and this sort of sense that many of these problems if they have a root cause somehow comes to that sort of sense of spiritual um lostness that so many so many of us have that our culture has and you've gone on a really fascinating journey with that from paganism to christianity you talk, talked about so uh, beautifully in the, the essay, The Cross and the Machine. Could you just sort of recap that that journey maybe for us and, and explain kind of how did you end up uh, where you are now? Well, I, I tend to write things because I'm better at writing than talking about them. So um, I just recommend you read the essay. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, um, uh, it's, it's a tricky one in a way, but I came to, I, I think I've come to see that everything I've been clawing at, all the stuff I was talking about just now, all, all of which are symptoms of a kind of cultural collapse, really, I think, all come down to that sense of a spiritual void. Um, and I suppose I've known that for a long time, but I didn't have the language to put it in, and I didn't have any uh, structure. I didn't grow up religious. My family weren't religious, um, and I grew up in England. So, you know, it was still a Christian country, technically, and we still all absorb the Christian ethics, whether we know it or not, even now. Um, but I didn't, I wasn't religious, didn't really like religion very much, didn't see the point of it. Um, That was true all the way through my young years, really, all the way through my adulthood, young adulthood anyway. I was a kind of annoying teenage atheist for a bit, Um, and then I was more broadly than that, somebody who all all of my life has been able to sense, uh, we we can all sense it if we pay attention, um, something that's very alive in the natural world, Um, some spirit that's in there that you can feel when you're watching a sunset on a mountain and you don't know what it is, but you can feel it's there. And that was what inspired me to become an activist when I was younger. It wasn't a desire to reduce carbon emissions. It was a sense that there was something powerful and important in the living world that we didn't have a right to destroy. Um, And that's actually a religious sensibility, although I would not have realized it at the time or called it that. Um, And as I got older, that started to manifest. And when I was 40, I I started exploring Zen Buddhism. I went on a few retreats and I became a Buddhist and I practiced that for quite a few years. And that was very useful in many ways, but it still had a hole in it because... Uh, and again, even in Buddhism, the whole is God shaped. Um, and so I sort of wandered into all sorts of all sorts of areas. I ended up becoming a, a part of a, Wic- a Wiccan coven, a coven of neo pagan witches, which was quite an experience. Um, I was looking for a nature religion, really. Um, 
that doesn't cut it for all sorts of reasons, partly because it's new and confected. And then I just had a series of experiences, which I wrote about in that essay, which basically dragged me towards Christianity, even though I didn't expect that or want that. Um, and the more I started to read about that, and the more I started to particularly explore Orthodox Christianity, which is where I ended up, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, the more I realized that there was a very old tradition here with a deep mystical heart to it, which I'd never come across, which isn't really something you were going to find in the Church of England. Um, and it's real, and it's and it's still alive, um, and it connects the kind of transcendence of God with the imminence of God and the earth with creation and the creation with the creator and all sorts of things that I, I hadn't known I was looking for. And yeah, it was a very strange and interesting experience that happened over the last few years. And it's really confirmed something for me. I suppose you can have ideas, but you have to have them confirmed intuitively, you know, or spiritual, spiritually. And it was very obvious to me that that spiritual void you talked about is the essence of what's going on. It's the essence of what's going wrong, I think, for us, certainly as a culture in the West. I don't think you can live without God. I don't think you can live without some form of grasping towards that. I don't think there's ever been a culture on earth that I'm aware of from the smallest tribe to the biggest civilization that has ever not had some kind of spiritual core, some kind of structure that is designed to speak the name of God in whatever language they speak it in except ours. We're the only one that's done that. And really very, very recently to cre create this kind of um, post-enlightenment consumer culture in which kind of uh, economics and reason replaced that deep spiritual intuition we had. And to imagine that that's going to fill the void is turning out to be wrong, which is probably why I suppose a lot of people have been saying that to you. I mean, I hear a lot of people saying that to me all the time, especially since I've written about it, not all Christians by any means. But it's just, I think, increasingly obvious we're only two or three generations away uh, from, you know, a society which was quite openly Christian, I suppose. And it's already manifestly coming down. You know, there is no core to, to the way we live and there's no meaning to it either. Um, and I just think that's, yeah, more and more day by day, I can see that that's the essence of things. Um, and it's, it's been quite a discovery. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating. So, as I said, like this is this sort of whole left by religion, I think, is something that connects a lot of the people that we've spoken to on the, the channel. And it's I, I find it very interesting. You I think you've had a conversation with Jonathan Pajot in mm. the past and Paul van der Klee. And when we talk, a lot of our conversations, like they're obviously they obviously believe that Christianity. It's like what goes in the in the in the place of religion. So someone like John Babaki talks about the religion that is not a religion. Someone like Jonathan Pajot and Paul van der Klee would say, no, no, we've got Christianity. We just need to reboot Christianity. So I find your I find your journey really fascinating as someone who's clearly modern. Like you're not from a sort of traditional back, traditional Christian background like those two, but you've ended up there. Um, so I find that a really fascinating journey, and I wonder whether you think that some form of rebooted Christianity has to be the, the solution to the spiritual void? Well, I'd say a couple of things there. I'd say firstly, um, you know, in the West, we're still basically Christian anyway. I mean, you, you, you've probably read Tom Holland's book, Dominion, Dominion, or heard about it. A lot of people have. It's, mm. it's gone down very well. It's very good. Um, he's not the first person to have said that, but it's a really good... Um, summary of how christian we are even though we think we're not obviously you don't have to be a practicing or a believing christian but you're still imbibing the ethics which have been created by 1500 years of christendom i mean the whole of the culture of britain modern britain is christian the whole of england is christian the whole notion of england is a christian nation it always has been the church and the and the, the monarchy were kind of the two things that brought the english nation together in you know the eighth century and that's true of most other european nations in different ways the only thing, I mean, we talk a lot about the West at the moment. You hear it everywhere. The decline of the West is the West in decline. What should we do about the, the, the West and its collapse, etc.? cetera? Um, the only reason to talk about the West is because the West was the remnant of the Roman Empire, which became the Western Christian Church. There's nothing else that, in, in, that ties all of these European nations together. I mean, we've been fighting each other for thousands of years. <laughs> you know, the only thing that makes the West even a thing is the fact that it used to be Western Christendom. So we're all culturally Christian already. Um, and yeah, you do hear a lot of this talk about kind of cultural Christianity, especially amongst more conservative people. 
And what I'd say to that is I don't think you can be culturally Christian by choice, right? I mean, you grow up in the West, you're basically going to be culturally Christian anyway, unless you come from an ethnic minority that is, you know, very specifically not that, then it's practicing another religion. And you've come from somewhere else. And if you've grown up in the West, whoever you are, you're going to imbibe all the values. Cultural Christianity is not really a thing for the simple reason that Christianity, like any other serious faith, is a faith and it has a truth claim at the heart of it. And the truth claim is the imminence and the transcend the imminence and the uh sorry not the imminence the um the word has gone out of my head the truth claim is the the existence of christ and his death and resurrection and that being the center of the world and that's not a kind of theoretical claim that's a claim about a spiritual truth in the same way that if you were a muslim the central belief that you would have would be the uh receiving of the word of god by the prophet muhammad that's not negotiable um it's not something you can culturally choose Um, And the same thing is true with Christianity. You can't choose to be culturally Christian if you fundamentally don't believe in what Christianity claims. Um, You you know, you can you can enjoy the cathedrals and the Bach concertos and the kind of the ethics that have come from Christian society. But there's no cultural Christianity without Christ. Uh, And that would be true of any religious form or any spiritual tradition you can't take out the belief at the center of it and make it into an intellectual construct you know you can't say well i quite like the west so i'll just sort of go to church even though i don't believe in it It doesn't work like that the reason that we have a society that was founded on christianity is that many thousands upon thousands of people died to build it because they believed in the truth of christ that's how it works right so if you want to build a christian society you better believe in christ if you don't you have to go and believe in something else um, so there's no there's no future for a kind of Christianity that's sort of pretending to be Christian because it likes going to church and it likes the forms. I think now that every society has a spiritual core to it, everyone. And if the spiritual core dies, then so does the culture. And I think that's what's happening to us. So, yeah, we could reboot Christianity, but we'd have to believe it. Right. I mean, a lot of people would have to believe, which is not beyond the bounds of comprehension, by the way, because the church is endlessly rising and falling and collapsing and being persecuted and coming back in different forms all over the world. It's always doing that. So um, I wouldn't count Christianity out, but it's not going to come back in the form it's existed in before. Uh, and we can't sort of pretend it into existence either. Yeah, um, let's, um, somebody just put, put Kierkegaard in the, in the comments there, and that's exactly, yeah, that's, that's the thing. You, know, you, you, you do have to believe it, I think. And I think, yeah, you, you do have to take the leap of faith. I mean, it's, it's like any any religious claim. You have to you have to say, yeah, you know, I'm I'm this this is truth. I believe it to be truth, and I'm going to live as if it is. Mm. Um, and if you can't do that, then something else will will fill the void. I mean, the way I see it is, there's there's it's like there's a throne at the heart of each culture, right? And somebody sits on the throne. And if you dethrone the person who sits on it, which in the case of the West was Christ, then someone else is going to come in. Which in our case, I think is kind of machine capitalism, you know mammon i suppose someone's going to be that you you're going to worship something right (laughs) whether you know it or not and that's i think that's who we are so that raises a lot of questions about what we're worshiping now yeah yeah it's a real open question i mean you saw you saw jordan peterson for example become hugely popular with his kind of interpretations psychological interpretations of the bible stories And so I think there is a possibility of some kind of reboot in a kind of maybe um, explaining why, what it is about the figure of Christ, what it is about the Christian story that is so resonant. But but it it also feels like it it seems difficult to to kind of credit that there could be a mass kind of reboot of Christianity at the same time. And I guess that's the sort of... Yeah, it, 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 it's a real puzzle. The more, the more I understand what a religion is and what a religion does, the more the idea of the sort of fairly naive, maybe slightly more new agey kind of, oh, we can, we can have some kind of spiritual core that isn't a religion seems quite naive because you actually realise, no, there's, there's so much, it's such a vast structure, mm. Christianity or any religion, yeah. that provides so many different layers of meaning for different people, depending on where they are in the developmental kind of path, that it seems an impossible task. Like it, it's, a, it's a completely open question. I'm much more open to the idea that 
something like, well, that, that Christianity is the only way that we could renew ourselves spiritually than I think I was maybe two or three years ago. But I still have a bit of a block believing that it, it could be possible. Yeah, well, I mean, I think a lot of people are in that place, and I would have been as well. A lot of stuff happened to me that I chose to believe was true. Um, and I do believe it was true, uh, weirdly. <laughs> but believe mm. me when I tell you that a few years ago, if you told me I was going to become a Christian, let alone an Orthodox Christian, I would have uh, probably fallen on the floor and laughed. Um, but look, the reason I became an Orthodox Christian, I mean, there are a lot of different reasons, but one of them is precisely that it's the oldest Christian tradition. And it's pretty much, it's not unchanged, but it's its tradition is, has been largely unchanging at its core since the, the apostolic era. Um, and that's, as you say, because a real religious system is precisely a system. I mean, this is what Jonathan Pajot talks about all the time. He's always talking about the symbolism of the system. It's not just a bunch of stuff that you shove together and, and because it sounds good, which is primarily what all of the sort of post-60s, new agey sort of stuff is. Uh, and that, that new agey stuff in all of its forms, including Wicca, which I was involved in, is a grasping by people towards a spirituality because they know they need it, but they don't want to go, they certainly don't want to go to the church and they don't really like structure and they don't like authority or hierarchy or tradition in any kind, any way, because that's what we're like in the West now, right? We reject all of those things. And the uncomfortable reality that I came to is you can't reject all of those things. You can't reject all the structures, the traditions and the hierarchies. That doesn't mean you have to accept everything that happened in the past or unquestioningly just follow things. But it does mean actually that religions, you know, again, religions exist for reasons, they're vessels. There's structures built around something that's believed to be a truth, and they exist to convey the truth in, in very imperfect forms because they're human constructions, and the Christians will be the first to tell you that humans have fallen and therefore they're going to mess stuff up, including their religious institutions, which happens all the time. So you don't expect your religion to be perfect, let alone the people who run it. But without it, you fall back on yourself. And I think that the fundamental Christian story, which I just keep endlessly coming back to, is the story of the fall. You know, this is really what it starts from. And if you look at the fall, it's an endlessly, endlessly happening thing. It's not, not just a thing that may have happened in time. It's a thing that's happening every minute to you. The fall is a story of humans that are in communion with God and they're in communion with creation and they're in communion and connection with everything else. And the one thing they're not supposed to do is eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because they're not ready for it. They're not mature enough yet. They're not wise enough yet. When they eat from that tree, they need to do it under God's guidance so they can use the knowledge of good and evil in a way that's wise and not selfish. But they don't do that. They're persuaded by the uh, the adversary, the little snake, to do it now, to follow them for themselves. And what's the consequence of that? Well, they leave the garden. They fall out of communion. We fall out of communion with everything else that lives. We fall into ourselves, and we fall into ego. And from that fo follows farming and technology and the Tower of Babel and civilization and all of the things that we have now all of which is a product of deciding to choose power over communion, to choose will, to choose the self. So you fall away from God and you fall into the self. And the trouble with some constructed new religions is that they're still based on the self. Um, they're still, if you try to construct your own religion, you're going to construct it around the things you like and the things you want. And actually at the heart of any serious faith is sacrifice. You're not supposed to get the things you want all the time. This is the story of Christ. Does he get the things he wants? No, he doesn't. He's crucified. He's tortured and dies. And through weakness, he becomes strong. You have to give up a lot of things for any serious faith. So you can't construct a religion that you just like the sound of, that has all the bits that, that flatter your ego, because even though it might seem spiritual, it ends up just uh, expanding your will rather than, you know, there's a difference between the, the famous Christian prayer, thy will be done, which happened, you know, which occurs in the Lord's Prayer and, and the kind of Alistair Crowley prayer, which is um, do what thou wilt. You know, that's at the heart of neo-paganism in its various forms. You have to sub subdue your will to something. You have to make sacrifices. So it all starts there. And I think all cultures start there. They start with a belief in the way that you can get to God, which in Christianity is through Christ. And you follow that path and you have to make sacrifices for it. You're supposed to carry a cross in Christianity. It's not supposed to be fun. Christ tells you that if you follow this path, everyone's going to hate you, by the way. So <laughs> it's not it's not supposed to be comfortable. Um, but the culture gets built around that. And that's true in non-Christian cultures too, right? There's always, as I say, there's always some sense of the sacred that people are prepared to sacrifice for because they believe it to be true. If you don't have that, if you're living in the self all the time, which we're encouraged to, the whole of our culture encourages us to just live according to the desires of the self every minute. I think you could usefully say that our society actually 
encourages every one of the seven deadly sins, which I find quite intriguing. If you look at the list, right, the, all of them contribute to economic growth. So that's who we are, literally, antichrist. Um, so we got to we got to get out of that. Um, and Christianity would certainly be one way to get out of that. Yeah. But you have to believe it. You know, you've got to you, you have to take that leap. Um, but there are other cultures which are not Christian. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the strength is there as well. Whether, whether the truth is there is another matter. But, you know, you don't have to be a Christian to create a society which is spiritually strong and has a sort of core and a sense of, of meaning to it. But I do think you have to have God at the heart of it. Which, as I say, I, even five years ago, I would have been extremely uncomfortable saying any, anything like that. Probably when I met you, I would never have conceived of that I would end up saying that. But that's what I've come to. And that, that just opens up all sorts of questions and possibilities. Yeah, I'm really just, by the way, Helena and anyone else, if you want to add your questions to the Q&A sheet, I just put that into the chat again. Um, yeah, I've always been fascinated by some of the kind of conversion stories of history, in particular T.S. Eliot, I think, given that he kind of, I think, articulated the modern condition early and incredibly well in The Hollow Man and many of the other the poems in the sort of 1920s, and then ended up a, ended up a Christian. Someone like John Donne as well from, from a long time before was sort of a he was kind of rebel. He was he was definitely someone who was sort of challenging authority, and then became I think Archbishop of Canterbury eventually, or yeah. certainly kind of high up in the in the church. And so I'm kind of fascinated by these these figures from from, from the past who kind of ended up on a similar trajectory. Um, yeah, you do you are you familiar with T. S. Eliot's kind of? Yeah, fairly. I mean, I'm not an expert, but I've certainly read plenty of him. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It happens to it's, it's it's a very common trajectory. I mean, I'm just one of millions of people who who end up there because I think it's if if you are looking for that sense of of meaning and also the sense of what a society is structured around, you can't avoid it. And as I say, I think it's only in the last hundred years in the West. I mean, most of the world, this isn't happening as well. It's worth saying this is a Western problem, right? I mean, it certainly is happening in other places, but nothing like it is here. I don't think there's any other part of the world. That has abandoned religion in the way that Europe has. Um, in other in other places, it's actually going quite fast. So it's it's quite a unique thing. We're kind of experimenting on ourselves. We're carrying out a giant controlled trial on <laughs> on our on our culture. What happens if you try to live without faith? Um, and it's I don't have to say I don't think it's going terribly well at the moment. And do you see it? I mean, I, I think I can tell from your uh, comments so far that the answer, but. Are you seeing sort of the Christian story as a as a very accurate metaphor, or are you seeing it as essentially true? No, you have to see it as true. You have to believe in the incarnation and the resurrection, otherwise it is just a metaphor and then it falls apart, which is what's happened in the Church of England and in a lot of Protestant denominations, actually. Once you decide that, you know, the miracles were just metaphors and everything's a metaphor and the, the, the resurrection is just a story about how you have to make a personal sacrifice. Well, that's all fine. That, that might be true. Um, but it doesn't, you wouldn't build your life around that. You know, that would just be an interesting story and a useful story that you could put in with Jung and Freud and everyone else. Um, there's, uh, as I say, it, you know, if, if you, if you're following a faith, you're doing it because you think it's real. I mean, I wouldn't spend my time praying and fasting and going to church on Sundays if I thought it was just metaphorical. <laughs> I could, that would be a waste of my time. No, I think it's true. Um, I think you have to believe that. Um, so yeah, I, that's. I mean, I'm not telling anyone else what they should believe. I'm just speaking for myself. Um, but I don't see how. I don't see why you'd bother with a religion if you didn't believe the central claim at the heart of it. You know, you can go into a cathedral and listen to the choir without having to be baptized. So you know, it's there has to be something to that. I mean, you mentioned Jordan Peterson. It's quite interesting because he. I found it very significant that he. You know, he is this kind of middle-aged Canadian professor putting up videos on YouTube that last about three hours of him lecturing about the Old Testament in a very ugly lecture theatre. And there are four million people watching that stuff, you know, each time, which is bizarre and probably not have happened 10 years ago, except that it's not bizarre because it's speaking to exactly what we're saying here, which is this crisis of meaning. 
But now, these days, you watch him now, he's being he's being hunted by Christ and he's trying to ward him off. It's quite interesting. <laughs> you know, he's kind of giving these videos in which he says he believes in Christ, but he doesn't know what to do with it. It's very intriguing. So it's almost like he's he's fighting to keep his understanding of Christianity kind of psychological and metaphorical, but it's becoming something else, which is quite intriguing. But, I mean, I'm sure he's brought so many people to... to to that path, or at least to even think about what the kind of mythic heart of, of the culture is. It's mm. enormously significant to see that happening, and he wouldn't have that kind of level of fame and purchase if there wasn't something big coming on, some big need that he was he was speaking to. And he's not the only one doing it, but he's maybe the most well-known at the moment. Yeah, and it's also fascinating that I don't think he would have had that traction had he been a Christian. If he, if, mm. if he no, was easily... Yeah, if he was easily kind of characterizable as, oh, he's that Christian professor, mm. he would have been easily kind of put into a box. And I don't think people would have listened to what he was saying, which is also kind of yeah, fascinating. No, I, I think that's true. I think we're kind of vaccinated, to use a current metaphor, we're vaccinated against Christianity in the West. It's like mm. we don't want to listen to Christians at all. I mean, I didn't want to listen to Christians all my life. If someone had ever come up to me and tried to sell me Christianity... I would have walked away and it didn't happen to me like that. And I would never try to persuade anyone else of it either, because it's just, it's nobody's listening anymore. We're, we're the new, we're the new pagans here in the West. And we don't want to hear that stuff because we've had it for a thousand years for whatever reason. Uh, you're right. It's, it's something, especially in Britain, which is a very kind of, you know, ironic country. We're, we're sort of slightly ironic about all things spiritual in a very British way. So it's, um, maybe it's a bit different in America, but yeah, I think we are kind of inoculated against it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting one, but you're right. I mean, that, that impact is precisely because he comes at it from a more kind of acceptable angle, he's, which is this psychological angle, this Jungian angle. And the way he talks about the myths is also very eye-opening. And, yeah, Jonathan Padgett does, does that too, you know, the way that you're effectively presenting these things as myths, which is what they are, myths as in mm -hmm. founding stories as opposed to lies. Um, you know, they, they're deep meaningful stories that have a lot of layers to them that are not what they seem on the surface because only a lot of biblical stories seem absurd on the surface but once you start to dig into them there's mm. a huge amount going on that you didn't know was there and he's very very good at laying that out before you and then giving you you know weeks to think about it which you need so yeah it's um it's almost like a process of rediscovery but you're right it takes somebody who's not a believer as such to to actually do that yeah and it was a fascinating thing to see in sort of 2017, 2018, where I think you saw online in real time this kind of the, the weight of argument shift from kind of the new atheist perspective, which was very much kind of ridiculing uh, religion to a pers the perspective that Peterson was bringing, which is effectively, look, these are ancient stories that are painstakingly evolved that have gone through so many. So the argument of you're an idiot if you believe this to you're an idiot if you don't think that there's some there's got to be some um reality or some kind of deeper meaning to the fact that these things have sustained for such a long time mm. i mean the other thing is i think you can you can't basically argue anyone into anything i mean nothing like this you can't i don't think you can maybe you could argue someone into atheism but probably not they'd probably have to want to be on the verge of going there anyway and you certainly can't argue someone into religion any more than you can argue someone into liking you or you know, enjoying a certain piece of art or music or something. You can't do that. You can maybe use argument to explain why you believe in something, but it's not operating on that level at all. It's there's something else going on. And um, yeah, that, that's that, that mythic structure, the thing that all the stuff that boils away below the surface is what is what really forms people and cultures, I think. So mm -hmm. that's, um, there's a lot bubbling away under the surface of the kind of West at the moment, and we don't really know where it's going, but it's like an active volcano about to blow. <laughs> I yeah. don't know what it's going to look like. Yeah. So I'd love to start. We've got some great questions already in the, in the question sheet, and it feels like there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, for this conversation, so I'd love to open it up as soon as possible. I'm going to open up the breakout rooms now for about... Uh, 10 or 12 minutes and the invitation is to um yeah to reflect on the conversation and also like what if, what are your impressions or your experience with christianity do you think that it is there is any chance that it could become um that it could see some kind of a of a what's the word reboot or 
is there an alternative to the sort of the, the hole in the in the soul left but with religion left by religion there'll all be rooms of three and then we'll be back in here in about 10 or 12 minutes and we'll get a few reflections and then we'll move into the q a a more more open discussion and see everyone back here very soon So we have everybody back from the breakouts. So I would love to, to hear any sharings from the breakouts. And if there's, if there's questions that have come up, we'll maybe share them with the, the group now. And we'll um, then also go to the Q&A sheet. So you can also add, add into the Q&A or upvote any of the questions that you particularly like. But I think we're a small enough group that you, if you'd like to to share just uh unmute yourself and go for it yeah i, I can go ahead and share and what was really cool is i don't know if this was your puppetry wizardry david um but i was in with uh terry and then david hagar and and we've known each other now through rebel wisdom for over a year talking about these very issues. And so we sort of kicked it off with exploring how things may have changed for us or shifted for us on this very topic of the validity of Christianity. And uh, I mean, we probably could have gone for another hour. We, we were barely scratching the surface, but it was just very, it was very powerful and meaningful to have people who are now, you know, friends uh, wrestling with this and not just rebel wisdom, future friends. So thank you. That was the algorithm that that arranged that for us for you. Or the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's right. I'm going with that explanation. <laughs> Does anyone else like to share from their breakouts? I'll say something. We it's Jonathan here. Good evening, and thanks again, guys. We. Uh, the algorithm did a, a, a clever move for us and put some locals from Copenhagen and Spain together. We had a lovely chat, actually. But the theme was that whilst we have a tremendous respect for things religious, including Christianity and its role in our civilization and its continued force for good in the world, the, 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 the idea was that, and at least in our group, that we had converged more on this idea of a, a belief in, 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 a, in a higher order purpose, but um, more, of, more of a kind of a, an Eastern style interconnectedness of all things. Um, and I think that was more of the prevailing thought there was that we have a, an attraction to, to that sense of all. We completely agree with you that there's a, a God-shaped hole and a crisis of meaning, but not 100% sure that the Christianity in the form that it is today is the is necessarily the only. That's not to disrespect what you're saying. Again, you know, full respect for those that do believe, just that, that it was, um, we didn't necessarily feel that that was the, the full answer for us in our group. That was it. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Did you want to reflect on that, Paul? Um, well, I mean, um, yeah, I think it's important to approach this stuff the right way around. I mean, I think if you go saying, right, what's the what's the answer for us as a society? What religion should we have, or something like that? Then um, you're sort of approaching it from the wrong place. Um, I mean, I'm not interested in trying to make. Britain Christian again it's not my business to do that <laughs> I'm not interested in trying to make anyone Christian um if you ask me about it I'll tell you um but it's I think that all of this is it's a call that you have if you if you become if you become religious if you follow a faith it's because you're called to it for whatever reason and that call is going to be very different for everybody and then you have to follow it and you have to try and live it in your life and you have you have to have a faith that you've been called to it for a reason and that things are happening for a reason as well. So, um, you know, if Britain, if, if lots of Britain becomes Christian again, then it will become Christian again because lots of people have, have, have believed in it. And by the way, if lots of Britain does become Christian again, it might be very much more likely to be re-evangelized by people from Africa because I suspect there are far more African Christians in Britain today than there are kind of native Britons in the church. Um, it's quite interesting in itself that. Um, I sometimes feel like Europe's being re-evangelized by Christians from you know, Romania and and, po and Poland and Nigeria, rather, and, and, and that in itself is, is an interesting situation. But yeah, I, I I think you know we 
we, all we can do is look for truth and see where it finds us. And then, then it finds us there. Um, and as I say, I don't think it, as soon as you start saying, well, okay, this is my face, this is the right one, so let's all adopt this, then obviously you're on for a futile argument or a religious war. So so we have to, you know, you have, actually have to, you actually have to trust in God if you think there is one. And that's what it comes down to, because whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. And you, all you can do is follow the path you've got and see where it goes. And all the, you know, the, I mean, if you, if you look at the history of, say, Ireland, where I live, or indeed Britain, uh, the, the early monks who really founded Christian Ireland didn't set out to form a create a Christian country or you know, create a thing called Christendom or anything like that. They just set out to do God's work and then to teach people about it and, and to create monasteries and do what they could do to spread the word. That was it. And they didn't know what was going to happen. And that's all you can do. Uh, that's where you start, whether you're Christian or anything else. So that's, uh, that's how it seems to me. I'm going to invite Terry to to speak, as I know you are really looking forward to this session and your um, question has been upvoted quite a bit. Uh, the second question about... Uh, um, which, one, which one would you prefer, Terry? I think the second one. Um, yeah. First, Paul, I really, really appreciate your sharing about your journey. Uh, it's it it i relate to it and it's it's compel it's fascinating it's intriguing so thank you so much uh, how do you see from inside orthodoxy do you see it um either orthodoxy itself um having a different relationship with the social issues of the day all the stuff we blame christianity for is there a way that Christ, that orthodoxy is more or less guilty? There we go. That's um, part one. And part yeah. two, individual orthodox folks. Do you see a difference in how their Christianity plays out in their lives from Western Christian? Um, yeah, well, maybe you could be a bit more specific on the first question of talking about sort of social issues and problems and things. Have you got specific things in mind? So all the stuff you hear about, uh, uh, you know, the patriarchy, the wars, the, the, the killing of indigenous people, all that stuff. Are you going to tell me that's that was all Western Christianity who did that? Well, uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to tell you is that humans are all fallen, and so we all do this stuff. That's what I'm going to tell you, <laughs> for starters. So I'm not going to put the Orthodox Church on a pedestal. Um, it, it is true that the Orthodox Church didn't lead any crusades, uh, and uh, they didn't do a lot of the stuff that the Western Church did. Although you know, the Orthodox Church is responsible to, for some pretty terrible things in the past in Orthodox countries sometimes. Um, I, I don't know of a any faith tradition that is not responsible for things like that. Even the Buddhists are at it in, in, in Burma. Um, the atheists, obviously, uh, in, in, in Russia and China are at it or were at it. The Muslims are at it. There's not, a, there's not a religious tradition or indeed ideological tradition that doesn't involve some people wanting to kill or oppress others in order to force it onto them, which is a human manifestation. That doesn't excuse anything Christians have done. I'm not interested in defending terrible things that have happened but it's not certainly not unique to christianity it's a way that humans behave um and it tends to be a way that humans behave certainly in the christian tradition right that's the thing you can only do if you're not actually following what you're taught to do by christ there's no way you could behave like that if you were actually listening to the sermon on the mount properly it's not actually very complicated we know that there's no justification for a holy war or any of these other things um, and there's not any justification for forced conversions or any of the other stuff that's happened. So when you, it, it's more that when you tie up a religious belief with kind of institutionalization and empire and power and money and all of these other things, then you're going to get this 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 terrible stew. Um, so I don't think that that, you know, it's as I say, it's it's not inherent to it's not inherent to the claim of a faith that people behave barbarously in its name because they'll behave barbarously in the name of anything. Um, the claim is either true or it's not true. And if you believe it's true, you have to behave like it is. And that means you have to live like a Christian and that's supposed to be a life of sacrifice. So the fact that lots of Christians haven't done that doesn't negate the fact that lots of Christians have. You know, I mean, the thing I find most inspiring about Christianity is reading the lives of the saints. And that's particularly strong in orthodoxy um, because they're the people who live this. 
the very best people. Um, and I have met, I mean, one of the things that got me into the Orthodox Church is that the people I've met are so kind and so friendly and so Christian, actually, in the best possible way. Um, not at all intolerant and, and prejudiced. And if they were, I wouldn't have gone there. Um, they're very strictly Christian. They're following the path and the faith. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the love is there, actually, which I've been really pleased to see. But this is, it's just, you know, we have to follow that. And some people will follow it well, and some people won't. There are bad Christians and good Christians, and we're all kind of doing our thing. But that, that will be true, as I say, of any kind of path, I think. So I think you have to go back to the original claim and see what that is and see if you believe it. And then you have to look at the people who are really following it, you know, the, the saints and the, the maybe the monastics, the people who really are, are trying to live that way. I mean, I, I, I actually judge spiritual traditions now by seeing if they have wise elders. One of the things that interested me about neo-paganism was I couldn't find any wise neo-pagan elders, actually. But I can find wise Christian elders. And I've met wise elders in other traditions as well. There were, there were wise elders when I was a Buddhist too. If a tradition can produce wise elders, even if most of us don't become like that, um, yeah, I think that there's some truth in it there. That's the way I see it. I was going to ask um, Helena, do you like to ask your question? Sure. Um, kind of going through what Jonathan was mentioning, uh, my question is, can morality and ethics exist on their own without religion? The question on whether you can have morality or ethics without religion is like the oldest question ever, isn't it? And I'm not remotely qualified to answer it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I suppose you'd have to look at a non-religious society and see if you thought that their morality and ethics was working. I mean, I don't, certainly don't think it is in ours. I certainly don't think you have to have religion as an individual to be virtuous or ethical obviously that's not true and neither is it true that religious people are necessarily virtuous and ethical by the way i mean you do have to be following this thing properly um it doesn't follow that it's because you go to church you're a good person or because you don't you're not that's not really the point um so i don't know what the answer to that is and i'm not making a claim that you have to be a christian to be virtuous or anything like that i wouldn't i wouldn't do that um what i can say is that for me and this is certainly the claim of the orthodox church um that's I, I do feel, and this, this regardless of, of being a Christian, I, I do feel that the, the real the crisis of our, our, age, our age is individualism. You know, it's, it is precisely our desire to just manifest our will all the time. If you've got millions of people all pursuing their individual desire, then you've got consumer capitalism and you've got a kind of selfishness and, and a focus on, on the self, which sort of poses sometimes as liberation, but actually isn't. Um, and again, the interesting claim in the Orthodox Church, which I hadn't even considered before I started looking into it, is that what we consider, certainly what I've considered to be freedom in the past, is actually a form of slavery. It's slavery to the passions. So you think you're free, but actually you're being tugged here and there by all the little desires that you have, which is not a dissimilar claim to the one that's made by Zen Buddhism, by the way, um, that unless you really start to examine what's driving you, you're going to be a slave to it. So... Yeah, I mean, look, there are there are sort of mindless ways to be Christian and just you know, a sort of mindless following of authority. But then there's also a, an intelligent obedience to the traditions of a faith. And I think that if you try to take the tradition and the obedience out of it, actually, which is not necessarily obedience to an individual person telling you what to do, it's the obedience to a tradition that's developed over a long time. Um, then without that, you do end up in this kind of, everyone's trying to personally create their own spiritual order. And I don't think it's worked. Um, and also I think that, you know, there's truth and then there's things that aren't true. And we all have to make our decisions about what we think those things are. But that it comes down to the heart of that. I mean, if you think there's a God, then you have to explore what that means and how you're going to, how you're going to build your life around that. And if you think there isn't, then you've got another load of different questions to ask. And they're both, you know, only you can sort of decide that, but, but yeah, I do think that, so yeah, Jonathan, Jonathan's just said, Jonathan Haidt would argue that non-religious morality is very one-dimensional care versus harm. We lose moral tastes. I think there's something to that. And I think that, I mean, look, you could look at, look at the culture war. This is an interesting example of, of, of something that feels religious, but is lacking a spiritual dimension. So you've got a huge number of people, especially on the left, kind of arguing about exactly about care versus harm and how we can protect X, Y, and Z person or, or group. And it's like inherently at the heart of that is something that ought to be good, but actually often manifests in a, in a, in a really nasty way on both sides of that conflict. And so there's also a sense that if you don't have 
some sort of higher sense of what's true and a higher sense of what's right, then how could you ever decide whether it was right or wrong to behave in a certain way? And are you then just committed to endless social conflict as we all fight over what's right and wrong in the streets? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not, but it's not looking great at the moment. So, so yeah, but uh, as I say, these are, I think ultimately these are, these are kind of matters of the heart, you know, the matters of the soul. We have to work them out for ourselves and then choose a path. But I think a path is necessary. That's what I came to understand anyway. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Max, your question, I think, is next. Hi, Paul. Um, what do you make of the Gnostic Christian worldview? Yeah, I mean, I'm an Orthodox Christian, so I'm not going to have a lot of time for Gnosticism, but I find it very interesting. Um, and th there's a lot of talk around a moment at the moment I've, i've seen this from a lot of different writers and thinkers that we're in quite a gnostic age and that gnosticism is almost the the faith of of the 21st century because gnosticism fundamentally uh, posits the notion that we are trapped in the material world and the material world is fundamentally evil like you say it's created by this evil being that there's a higher being who is virtuous, but the lower being, this demiurge, is, is created the world. And we're, so we're good spirits trapped in evil matter. And there's, a, there's an interesting relationship between that and the notion that at the moment that we can escape from our bodies, it's very transhuman, uh, that we can you know, create our own identities, um, whether it's genders or anything else. Um, and there's a kind of interesting, there's a lot of interesting people around this. Mary Harrington writes about this a lot. Um, she's a very interesting writer on this, that we're living in this kind of neo-Gnostic age, that we don't have a connection to our bodies, that we reject matter as evil, and we think that we can construct our own personalities. And that actually takes us straight into Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse in the end. You know, that's the ultimate aim of, the ultimate endpoint of this kind of sort of neo-Gnosticism. So it's quite interesting that. I mean, the, you know, traditional Christianity sees both matter and spirit as as you know necessary and connected and potentially virtuous if fallen uh, and if you reject matter i think you're going to get into trouble because that's rejecting nature ultimately fundamentally and then then kind of all bets are off so it's an interesting conversation to have that one i think ron walk out hey hey paul uh it's kind of a, a large subject however you want to take it um you know we're in a sense making space It's supposed to be about how to make sense of the world. And we also talk about uh, different ways of knowing. And so I, I wanted to ask you about how you view the role of myth, mythos, allegory uh, in the modern world, how, how you hold all that. It strikes me that broadly in the culture, there's the kind of literalist view of a lot of uh, the religious stories. And then there's the materialist scientific pushback against that. And if anything, some people try to split that baby and they're like, yeah, these myths are nice. It's kind of a dismissive. Yeah, they're nice stories and we can learn from them, but it, it seems to lack the, the deeper richness of what myth and allegory's place really is in the religious tradition. So I was curious how you view uh, all of that. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, it, it does get to the heart as well of why I became an Orthodox Christian, which is a bit of a weird thing for an English man who lives in Ireland to have done. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, so there's this, on the one hand, we have this literalist version of Christianity, which seems to be quite big in America. Uh, and then you have the sort of, as you say, the new atheist deconstruction of that. And both of those are very modern trends, you know, literalist Christianity in the sense of looking at the Bible and seeing it as a scientific textbook. It's not something that ever happened during the Middle Ages, and it's not something that's ever happened in the Orthodox Church. It's a very kind of Uh, it's a sort of weird modern manifestation of the scientific age. And then, of course, it's easy to deconstruct it because it's not true. You know, it's, the Bible is not supposed to be a scientific handbook. It's, a, it's a, as you say, it's a collection of myths. And long before I was a Christian, I was doing a lot of writing about myths. I have, uh, I have a, a good friend, Martin Shaw, who runs the West Country School of Myth and Story in England, who's well worth looking into if you're interested in the mythic structures of things. Um, I, th I mean, the, one of the central claims at the heart of the Dark Mountain Project was that everybody lives by myths, whether we know it or not. And so modernity is full of myths too. And the fundamental myth of the modern world is the myth of progress, which is this, you know, this, this notion that time is linear and we move forward towards endlessly improving kind of scientific knowledge and technological prowess. Um, and that's kind of 
that's almost teleological in a way. And we believe that very deeply. And some people have suggested that that's a kind of weird bastardization of Christianity and there's something to that. But I think the mythic structure of reality, which certainly you can see when we you watch Jordan Peterson talk about the book of Genesis, for example, is absolutely the heart of, of the traditional religious claims. And a lot of modern versions about, of, of Christianity dispense with that. They're very, very empty. A lot of Protestant versions of Christianity, very, again, very literal minded, very, very much about morality, actually. I mean, somebody, Terry, in the conversation here says, Christianity is as much about dynamic input from spirit as static rules from tradition and scripture, which is absolutely true. And the, the only purpose of having any rules and, and pointers towards morality and goodness, apart from just trying to be a better person for your, for your neighbours, is that they align you towards God. And that all, all of the mythic structures that, that, that our culture is built on are almost there under the surface. So you're right, absolutely. Uh, we have to remember, we have to understand that Christianity, like any ancient faith, is not the only one that this is true of, has a really deep mythic structure, which we don't even necessarily understand when we read it on the surface. And if you read, I don't know, the story of Noah's Ark and, and see it as a literal story that's supposed to have happened sometime in time, and then you go looking for the boat on the mountain, you've missed the point. Uh, and similarly, if you dismiss the whole thing, as you say, as this kind of big metaphor, then then you've missed the point as well. There's something in there that's speaking to the to the mythic structures at the heart of of our existence, and that's the stuff we're missing in the West. That's the stuff we're missing. And however useful science and progress can be, without that sense of the mythic underpinning of what we are, the shape of reality, the kind of symbolic reality, then we're kind of all at sea. And I think that's where we are now. And whether we like it or not, our mythic structure in the West was built on the Christian story, which doesn't mean everybody has to go off and become a Christian. It just means that's where we are. That was the structure that our culture was built on. And now it's gone away or we've gone away from it. So we're in this place. And yeah, I think it's a very, very interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, you mentioned Mary Harrington, who we've had on here before, hmm. really have you been, have you had a dialogue with her? No, never have done, but I, I really enjoy reading her stuff. It's very interesting. Yeah, and I wonder if you'd be interested. Maybe I'll see if she. I'm sure she'd be up for coming back if you fancy. Yeah, that would a be dialogue very with her at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that'd be a fun, fascinating conversation. Um, so where are we? Oh yeah, David Hagar. I'm curious. You know, like the traditional answer in Christianity is, well, like you just have this transformative experience and you believe and there's this process of faith and that goes all the way back to like, I don't know, it was like Augustine or something. And there's this whole separation of the world between regular reality and like faith. And like, in your view, how do you, how do you get at some fundamental religious epistemology? Mm. You mean in terms of find, finding truth when you say getting at epistemology, what do you, what do you mean? Like if, if, if somebody makes a claim about the nature of God mm. and some narrative, whether it be Christianity or anybody else, like how does that, how does one bring that down to say, okay, Christianity is somehow special versus this other thing like yeah. there, there there is some sense making there is some epistemology that says something here agrees with something mm. well there's a couple of claims i suppose in orthodoxy not just in orthodoxy in traditional christianity and not just in christianity either this is a, i think these claims you probably find them in in any major religion and the first one is that you can actually never know god you can never know the essence of god um in orthodoxy, for example, we talk about the two natures of God. There's the essence and then there's the energies of God. So the essence of God can never be known. Uh, and that's a claim that I think Islam also makes. It's a claim that Sikhism makes. I think it's a claim that Hindus will make as well. You can't know the essence of God. It's impossible, not in this life anyway. Um, but you can experience the energies of God, which is the what Christians would call the Holy Spirit. Or you could experience the energies of God in a forest or on a mountaintop or in your life or in prayer. Um, the other claim is that you can't know God with the rational mind. And this is maybe one of the, the fundamental differences between Western and Eastern Christianity, that in Eastern Christianity, although reason is perfectly useful as a tool, it's not a way that you can work your way to God with. Whereas I think same, since Augustine, Western Christians have believed that you can almost reason your way 
into understanding what God is, which is why there's so much theology in, 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 in Western Christianity compared to Eastern Christianity. Eastern Christianity is much more of a mystical path, which is to say it's experiential. You live through prayer and prayer is how you know God. And that actually is the fundamental claim. And obviously it's what a modern person would call subjective. There's no way to prove any of this is true. If you wanted to say I was deluded, um, then you could say that and I couldn't prove you up, could prove you wrong. I can't show you God. But the way that you the way that's worked for me is I've had a number of experiences which made me explore Christianity and then yeah, read about it, get into it, understand it, learn from people, and then actually begin to pray because prayer is at the heart of it. I didn't even know what praying was before I became a Christian, but praying is really just talking to God. Um, and the more you do that, the more in some inexplicable way it starts to deepen in you. And it, fundamentally something has changed inside me since I became a Christian and I couldn't put my finger on that, but people around me have noticed it as well, which is interesting to me. So it's manifesting in some way in my life. I certainly feel a much greater sense of peace than I ever had before the sense making is a lot more sensible now. And it's not because I've mindlessly accepted a story. It's because the story has given me a structure to experience something that I continue to experience. I mean, it's a continual path of deepening Christianity. It's like any part that Buddhism would be like that as well. You know, you, the practice is what deepens it for you. You can say, Oh, sure. I believe in God. I'll get baptized and go to church. That's okay. But that's, that's the beginning of a process, the process of kind of prayer and in, in orthodoxy, say fasting and prayer rules and all of these things, all the structures that exist and the do's and the don'ts exist for the purpose of deepening the relationship with God, which happens internally. Like Christ says, the kingdom of God is within you. You know, it's not in the sky with the birds. It's in, it's in you. Um, and he specifically says that to his, to his disciples. That's where you experience it. So I think the test is. If you become a Christian or follow any traditional faith and you and you do it properly and you follow the rules, you'll find that the rules will deepen something that's happening inside you. Um, and if you don't feel that, then maybe it's not true or maybe it doesn't work or maybe it isn't real. But certainly for me, all I can say, I can't speak for anyone else. I can just speak for me and say that that is, that is certainly happening. I mean, and I'm also, I'm very new. I was only baptized in January, you know, so there's, I'm still, still an apprentice. So <laughs> I'm in the early days, so I can't speak with any authority about anything but that you you take the leap of faith and and then you follow the path and you you start to pray and then things happen and it certainly happened to me so that's that's how i make sense of it that's the, the only answer i can give really yeah i'm sure i could go back and forth for a long time but i'll let somebody else no, i'm sure <laughs> terry i did like um your uh first question um, yeah, I was curious, uh, if you don't mind telling us personally, Paul, how has your conversion been accepted in your personal social you circle? You just said people have noticed differences. Are they put off? Are they drawn, uh, skeptical? How is it affecting you and them? Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? Um, it's varied, really. I mean, I'm, I'm a writer, so I've got an audience. So when I first wrote about this, I had some people who wrote to me and said they thought this was wonderful and they were so glad to read it. And then I had other people saying they were never going to read me again because I was obviously a lunatic and this was ridiculous. And that's fine. <laughs> that's OK. Um, that's how it works. Um, so I had that. In my personal life, it's interesting because my, my wife is from an Indian family. She's British, but her parents were Punjabi so they're Sikh and she's a Sikh as well and she's in her uh, her kind of midlife like me discovering her rediscovering her path she's you know she's she's on the same road really of just having understood that the spiritual void is the thing but unlike me she had a tradition to go back to so um and Sikhism and Christianity are, are remarkably compatible actually it's very, very interesting. Um, the, the paths and the teachings are startlingly similar, actually. It's very, very interesting to, to see. So we, it, it's been actually really, really nice for both of us to come from different traditions and be able to zero in on the same thing um, and, and sort of learn from each other. So that's been great. Um, it's, I mean, it, it's been really nice. Um, my children, are, you know, they're fine. My daughter is actually quite keen on Christianity. My son's not really bothered about religion, but he's only 10. He prefers football. So um, he's, very, he's very patient with me talking about God all the time. But uh, my mum initially found it very strange. Um, she's not at all religious and wasn't sure what kind of a Christian I'd become and was quite nervous about it. But, 
yeah, she's fine now. She's she's very supportive. She's um, and and I think just generally, there's you know, the reactions will will. I haven't had any hostility amongst my friends and family. A bit of bemusement and befuddlement, I suppose. And I don't know what people are saying behind my back, but I haven't <laughs> haven't had any criticism. Um, I mean, I, I think my family probably think I'm a bit odd anyway, so they're kind of used to these things happening. But but no, I mean, actually, it's been in my personal life, it's been really nice to just it's almost like a it's like a strange sort of religious coming out actually you, you, you sort of you literally come out as, as christian and then everything starts changing for better or for worse in different ways but for me it's been it's been really nice actually i've, I've been quite blessed with it I, so far so good i think awesome so i think we've got uh time for one Last question, I think Martina. But it sounds like as though you're, um, you've had a real transformative experience um, in your conversion to Christianity and Orthodox. So, um, so I'm just wondering where that's going to lead to you now. Now, going well, who knows? Yeah, <laughs> but you know, it, it's interesting to me because yeah, well, I, I've been on, I've been a seeker all my life, I suppose, not a religious seeker consciously, but in all sorts of ways. As probably everyone on this on this call is, you know, as you say, it's sense making, trying to work out what what the world is fundamentally and what the shape of it is and where you fit in. And what's interesting to me is I spent ten years, as a lot of Western people do, on a spiritual path, looking for the truth, looking for, looking at faith, looking at different claims. Usually, looking anywhere but Christianity, because that's the last place we look in the West now. Interestingly, the last thing you want to do is go to a priest if you want to find the truth. <laughs> That certainly was true of me, ironically, but God has a sense of humor. Um, but the interesting thing to me was that I everything else I did, I went to because it interested me. So Zen Buddhism, various forms of paganism, Wicca, I looked at them and I thought, that seems to meet a need I've got. I'll go and explore it. And, you know, they, I did learn things from all of them. And Christianity was something which came to me and I didn't want it to come. And that was actually one of the reasons I decided it was true because I did feel like I was being pursued by this thing. And I thought, I don't want to be a Christian. I have no interest in this. And, and I ended up one and probably the most traditional form of Christian you can get as well. So that in itself was enough to make me think there was something real going on because this wasn't fulfilling a need in a way, or rather it was, but I didn't know it was a need. And as I said, it does feel transformative in a way that nothing else has felt to me. It feels like I've come home to the place I'm supposed to be. Which is very odd, but it's true. Um, but as I was also saying to um, to David just now, it's um, that that marks the beginning of a path. You know, the Christianity is a path. It's a journey you're supposed to walk with a cross on your back that's supposed to transform you. So I'm, I feel blessed to have had an initial transformation. But now I've got to do the work. You know, <laughs> I think I think the hard bit is probably yet to come. Um, but but I'm I'm happy with it. I, I you know it feels to me like the path that I need to be on it feels like the, the right one. Zach Parsons says the way down here, which is exactly what the early Christians used to call their path. Interestingly, they never called themselves Christians, by the way, though either they call themselves children of light, which I think we should re, I think we should just, we should get the vocabulary of the early church back. So the early Christians called themselves children of light and their path was not Christianity. It was the way, which is rather interesting. C.S. Yes, Lewis always, always talked about the, the similarities between Christianity and and Taoism, um, mm. you know, why not? It makes perfect sense. If 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 the Tao exists and and God exists, then the Tao is the way of God. So we could be children of light following the way, and we'd sound very different immediately. I think maybe we should do that. Sounds a little bit culty to me, Paul. Yeah, it's a little bit, but you know, <laughs> it's <laughs> I still like it. Awesome, and. Um, this has been a fantastic session. Thank you so much, Paul, for, for sharing so kind of frankly, honestly and beautifully about your journey and to everyone for some really fantastic questions and uh, great sharing. So, yeah, it's been a really special um, event. Yeah, well, thanks for the invitation and, and thanks for the questions. It's been really good. It is exactly one of those things that could go on for another five hours and still be very interesting. <laughs> but <laughs> you have to stop at some point. Exactly. Yeah, but we will certainly see you again, I'm sure, Paul. And I look forward to that. Yeah, me too. So as is traditional, if everyone would like to unmute themselves, we will say thank you to Paul and see you next week for another session, which I think next week is the Beatles. 
Eric Davis and Anderson Todd riffing on the psycho-spiritual dimension of the Beatles, which is going to be a lot of fun. Paul, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you David. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes, and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below, and we'd love to see you soon.